Um, I do want to go ahead and get us turned over to our speaker, Robert Poole. Um, his bio is on the sheet in front of you on the table, uh, but he is, of course, not just the director of transportation policy at the Reason Foundation, but he is the co-founder of the Reason Foundation and was its president and CEO from 1978 until 2000. Um, and we, uh, we were lucky enough to have in the room with us Chris Tomlinson, director of the State Road and Tollway Authority, DOT board member Robert Brown. Um, we got the regrets uh, from the DOT commissioner, Russell McMurray, uh, but he did want to pass this along. He said, I'm very sorry I can't attend as we are hosting the AASHTO annual meeting here in Atlanta, which is what brought uh, Bob Poole to town for this event. Uh, but please let him know I read and value his work and thought leadership. I hope he is aware of our plan to build a connected system of express lanes we also see the system vital for our transit future, pushing high capacity transit into the system that connects to the other transit or rideshare choices. And that's just really a testament to what the kind of um, vision that Bob has been um, putting forth into the world for a long time now. Uh, the, the big beautiful lanes that are mostly blocked by these other big beautiful buildings that they have. Uh, but if you live around here, you, you, you know exactly where they are because the construction's been going on for a few years and they recently opened earlier this month. Uh, but that, that concept uh, is, is something that, uh, that he came up with and, and promoted and now it is a reality here. And uh, so that's why we're all interested in what he has to say today. And without further ado, I'm gonna let him get to what he has to say today. Welcome Bob Poole. Thanks, Kyle and Benita. Thank you all for coming. I'm really pleased to be here. The Georgia Public Policy Foundation is one of a number of state-based free market think tanks, and it's one that uh, I personally hold in very high esteem as, as one of the most effective and, and best ones around the country. Uh, I'm going to talk today, uh, give you a brief uh, overview of the book that I, I spent several years writing uh, about the future of America's highways, uh, and uh, to just get right into it, I started working on transportation policy almost 30 years ago, and uh, at the time, we had chronic congestion on freeways, we had potholes uh, as a major problem around the country, we had deficient bridges in every state, pork barrel projects that uh, have uh, costs higher than their benefits, and endless battles over the basic funding source, the fuel tax. Well, it turns out, uh, here we are today, 30 years later, and we still have all of these problems. And in fact, the congestion problem is worse, uh, for the most part. And that got me thinking, well, maybe there's something wrong with how we're doing this. And we need to rethink. There's, you know, this is what I face every year, every day for 20 years in Los Angeles, and what a lot of you face here uh, uh, every day in, in Atlanta. Um, these numbers are the ones from the book. They're about uh, four years out of date. But $160 billion per year in direct costs of congestion, wasted fuel and wasted time. That's all that's included in that. Uh, but that's a pretty staggering number. And uh, uh, those, those costs per commuter are in, in many uh, locales are over $1,000 a year just in that direct cost. Congestion also, it, reduces the economic productivity of urban economies. That's a little more complicated, but uh, that's explained in the book, and, and we can do it in the questions if you, if you like. Potholes, uh, an organization called TRIP, the Road Information Project, that every few years does a nationwide study on the cost impact to motorists of pothole pavements, rough pavements. And they use a model that is very well expected, well respected in transportation, that takes into account the increased wear and tear, suspension systems, tires, wheels, so forth, and the annual de increased depreciation because of the wear and tear. And those numbers, those are those are some of the worst. I don't have in front of me the figure for Atlanta, but you know, in the in the multiple hundreds of dollars a year that most people don't even realize is is that they are incurring because of this this ongoing problem. Uh, here, here in Georgia. Uh, we do an annual report uh, that uh, now my colleague Baruch is, is in charge of producing 
on all 50 states looking at their highway systems and doing quantitative performance measures. We do an overall ranking. Georgia actually ranks 18, where one is, you know, first place is best and 50th is worst. So Georgia DOT is doing a much better job than average uh, overall. Interstate condition is 29th in the nation, not quite as good. Urban area congestion, you're way down near the bottom, uh, which is not something to be proud of. But the express toll lanes are going to start making a real impact on that. And the fraction of deficient bridges at 16% is much, much better than average. I mean, some of these states have 40% uh, or more deficient. Uh, but, but this is still, I mean, it's not, it's not wonderful. It's, it's better than average, okay, for Georgia. And here was the bridge on I-35 in Minneapolis that collapsed in, I think it was 2007. And deficient bridges, over 130,000 deficient bridges nationwide. This is a problem that varies greatly from state to state. Uh, Georgia, as I said, only 16%, but look at Rhode Island, more than half. Uh, Hawaii, 43%, New York, 38 So this, it's a problem that you, you really can, it's one way to measure how good or bad your state DOT is, is, is where you rank on the different bridges. And, and Georgia and Florida are both in much, much better shape than average, but still, you know, not as good as potentially it could be. Um, there's Sarah Palin and the famous bridge to nowhere when that controversy. Uh, the only good thing that came out of that was the congressional ban on earmarks in, in highway and transit programs. They're now talking about maybe reinstating that so they can all get along better. But the problem is, it's, it's not just earmarks in Congress. An awful lot of the decisions that Congress makes about transportation policy and that state legislators uh, is about political gains rather than economic value. An awful lot of projects get approved because legislators, understandably being legislators, want to have, want to be able to cut a ribbon in their district, if possible, every year, or at least uh, until every time between elections. So this is what I brought. Maintenance is invisible. And so maintenance ends up getting the short end of the stick, which is, which is really, really unfortunate because maintenance is probably the most important thing that they should be doing uh, because you've got assets that need to be maintained or you're going to have to replace them much sooner uh, at a much higher cost. And gas tax increases. Well, you know, the gas tax was invented by Oregon legislators in 1919 uh, when we really started to get growth in motor vehicles and the need for paved roads. And it was intended as a pure user fee. And within 10 years, it was such a good idea that within 10 years, every, all 48 states had a, had a gas tax. Almost all specifically allocated only to highways. So it was a user's pay, but the users got 100% of the benefits. Well, what's happened over time is that uh, this has morphed into, at the federal level as well as at the state level in most states, uh, a general purpose transportation tax that can be used for anything and everything. The federal government, now mind you, the federal government is supposed to be doing things that are national in scope and, and you know, authorized by the Constitution or interstate commerce. Well, there's now federal programs, 120 federal programs that can draw on federal gas tax and diesel tax monies. Bike, bike paths, trails, sidewalks, federal responsibilities, but you know, this is, I want to bring you something in the district. We need safe routes to school, so we need to have the federal government give you money to put more sidewalks in. <coughs> this is crazy, but it has destroyed the basic users pay, users benefit concept that the gas tax uh, was intended for. So, in thinking about all this, about 10 years ago, I started thinking, well, you know, what if we could have a different, a better model and a vision of the future that we would have largely uncongested freeways rather than largely congested. Uh, we'd have, where we need them, we'd have dedicated truck lanes on important routes where, where trucks are growing larger and larger fraction of the total traffic. No toll booths anywhere. I mean, funding would be from all electronic tolling like Peach Pass uh, here in Georgia and Sun Pass in Florida. Easy Pass all over the Northeast and Midwest. Uh, excellent maintenance. Things would stay in good repair because there was reasons to do that. You'd have the funds to expand the system when and where it was needed uh, without having huge political battles. And there would be a true user's pay, user's benefit system again. And I, I started talking about, thinking about that. And I started thinking about, well, we actually have that kind of a model for all of our basic regular public utilities. Electricity, telephones, natural gas, cable and satellite, water supply, all operate 
uh, in a kind of a system like that, uh, and you know what you pay and what you get. Uh, and I did some research to figure out what does the average household pay for each of its utility services, and wanted to compare that with highways. And you know, your numbers may be different from this, but these are national averages, again, that are about four years old, and the, the numbers that are in the book. Highways, I, it took me a while to get the data together, but I used, at the time, again, four years ago, the average uh, uh, how per household spending on federal and state fuel taxes uh, to, for the comparison, and that turned out to be $46. You probably, I imagine you're surprised that it's that low. You're also surprised because you had no idea what it was going to be, probably. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not transparent. All these other things, you get a bill, you know exactly what you used, and therefore what you paid because it was known rates. It, it's all disguised because you have federal money paying for this and that and the other thing, state money, local money, but there's no clear accountability. Uh, you don't know who to blame when things are wrong, uh, and you certainly don't know what you paid and whether it seems like a fair payment for the amount. So a lot of people would see that and say, okay, well, we just need to raise, spend more money. But my bigger insight is that it's not just the amount of money, it's how the decisions get made, and that's really what most of what the book is about. So, if you look at highways compared to all the other utilities, all the other utilities are businesses. Whether they're run by investor-owned companies or by governments, you probably get your water from a city water department, but it runs as a business. It sends you a bill based on how much water you use, and it uses that revenue. With that revenue stream, it can issue rent bonds for facilities to, to build a new wastewater plant or whatever it needs to do. Um, so it's not necessarily government versus private, although I do make an argument in the book that I think there's a lot of advantages to the investor-owned highway model, but I'm not saying you have to do that. Uh, but you, you, know, you pay the business based on how much you use, you get a monthly bill, so it's, it's transparent, and highways are, are so different, other than toll road agencies. A toll road agency is a government-owned business like the municipal water department that does know, tell you exactly what you're getting, uh, you know exactly what you're paying, and does use the revenue to issue bonds to pay for uh, uh, new capacity for replacing obsolete capacity. It has the means and the motivation to do those things without any, any big deal battles, other than environmental clearance, which of course anything has to do with. A new water plant has to get that. A uh, new transmission line has to get that. <coughs> so, Milton Friedman, uh, most people don't know this, but Milton Friedman and Daniel Borston, in about 1953, wrote a paper that got published uh, analyzing the, the dismal state of America's highways. Now this was before the interstate highways, but they basically said, Highways are a socialized industry removed from the test of the market. And basically there's no pricing, there's no financing uh, to the most part, except, again, except on toll roads, and there were only a handful of toll roads then. Uh, no customers. Uh, it's interesting. Uh, uh, when I started working with state DOTs and getting really involved with the Transportation Research Board and so forth, I started reading, you know, people who <coughs> drive on, 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 on highways and people who operate trucks are called users, universally in transportation. In all these other utilities, people are called customers. Now it's true, toll road agencies have customers, but, but state DOTs, highway departments, they have users. And believe me, I don't think this is just a matter of terminology. I think this reflects a mindset that they're, you're not their customers. Their customer, that who gives them, the, where do they get their money, and who do they have to please? It's the legislature, folks. It's not you. You are not, you are invisible to them, other than as a problem out there, <laughs> crowding the freeways that, that, you know, that they've nicely built, but, uh, and, and they complain about you. So, this is a very profound difference, and I think Milton Friedman, and he sent me that paper uh, when he learned that I was starting to work on this stuff in the uh, early 1980s. And I, I quote cited in the book, and, and uh, it's, a, it's a, the one thing he couldn't figure out how to, he and Danny both couldn't figure out how to do was how do you do a payment system? Uh, because the only thing he knew of was throwing coins in a basket for it. And he thought on a large scale, that's just not going to be practical. And how do you do real pricing with that kind of system? But he didn't know about that we would have electronic tolling uh, today, and that changes the whole business. So, as I said, highways as businesses could be 
industrial companies, it could be toll agencies like we have now on you know, a small scale. They could even be nonprofit user co-ops. And I'm just I put that in for completeness because in all of these other utilities, uh, that is a model. We have thousands of rural electric cooperatives. You probably have some of them here in Georgia, rural telephone co-ops. That's a perfectly viable model, usually for small-scale systems, where uh, the board members are some of the customers who get elected to the board. And so they have a built-in uh, interest in good quality service, but not in kind of outrageous prices and so forth. So that it's that those co-ops don't get it don't need external regulation from a public utilities commission like the investor-owned electric companies do because the, the interests align for, for good performance. Um, so, um, now, so the rest of the book, I try to make the case that this, my model of highways as, as business or highways as utilities is not necessarily a pipe dream. Not, being, not an easy transition to make, but I'll, we'll get into that a bit. But there's a whole history that I briefly recounted in the book of the private turnpikes prior to the automobile era. There were hundreds and hundreds of private turnpikes starting in New England. Uh, the first toll bridge in America was in across the Charles River uh, between Boston and Cambridge, Massachusetts, a private investor-owned company that, that got a franchise from the state to do that. Uh, we, uh, and, and we even had a lot of private turnpikes in California and Nevada in the second half of the 1800s, uh, again, before paved roads. Um, after World War II in Europe, uh, with, with much of Europe in devastated condition, France, Italy, Spain, and Portugal, uh, inspired, I think, largely by the Pennsylvania Turnpike, which was considered a huge success, built modern uh, uh, motorways, they call them, very equivalent of interstate highways, as toll agencies and investor-owned toll companies. And you can ride on the, drive on those today, and they're well-maintained, they go where you need to go. Uh, it is remarkable that, uh, and they think it just as a matter of course, a lot of the, the state-owned toll uh, entities, uh, which had the majority of the toll capacity in those countries, were all privatized around the turn of the 21st century. So they're all now investor-owned uh, companies. Uh, with, uh, with franchises like electric utilities have. They call them concessions, and I'll use that term later on. Uh, but after 50 years, 35, 70 years, whatever it may be, uh, the franchise expires, and the state then can decide, do we want to negotiate a renewal, or do we want to put it out to bid and have somebody else come in who will refurbish and, and, and expand or whatever? Uh, but it's that same utility model that we have with electric utilities in the United States that was, in, that was invented in Europe to do this. That model then in the late uh, 20th century spread to Australia. Virtually all of the expressways in Sydney, Melbourne, and Brisbane, the three largest cities in Australia, are investor-owned toll franchises like, like the, on the European model. And Latin America and in the last two decades has gone significantly into this. Brazil, Argentina, Chile, Colombia, Mexico are the five main countries that have done this with smaller scale projects elsewhere. In a lot of these countries, what they're doing in the, in the long haul, long distance things, they still have mostly two lane highways and they're uh, having competitive bidding for a franchise, a long term franchise for companies to come in and finance, build, operate and maintain modern, at least four lane divided highways with limited access and so forth, much safe and with toll financing. So this, this model is being used way more than, uh, than we think. And the United States is, has begun, finally, in the last uh, 15 years in particular. Uh, outside of Washington, D.C., there's the uh, express toll lanes on the Capitol Beltway on I-95. They're beginning to build a network, as you are here in Atlanta, beginning seriously to build a whole network of these to provide congestion relief. We have some existing toll roads like the Indiana toll road, the Chicago Skyway, and two toll roads in Puerto Rico that were leased to private uh, companies to expand them, uh, put in electronic toll collection, and modernize them and maintain them, uh, all using the toll revenues for proper operation, management, expansion, and guaranteed ongoing maintenance. Uh, partly because it's in their own interest to uh, you know, make sure the road is attractive so people will pay to come and use it, but also, it's, it's, there's provisions in the long-term franchise or concession agreement, all kinds of quantitative measures that they have to live up to, or there are penalties. 
and the ultimate penalty is termination for cause. <laughs> You're kicked out, and the money that you've invested is down the drain. And uh, so that's a pretty powerful sanction for making sure that they, they do the job they're supposed to be doing. Um, these are, in technical terms, they're long-term public-private partnerships. We call them P3s. Uh, the single team is selected competitively to design, finance, build, operate, and maintain for a long period of time. They're financed by debt and equity, just like you finance the purchase of a home. You put in equity as a down payment. You take out a mortgage for the for the loan. These are typically the uh, equity provided by various investors and debt, mostly in the form of, of toll revenue bonds, just like uh, toll road agencies use. Uh, there's significant risk transfers because when when that kind of a concession is agreed to, the risk of construction cost overruns is no longer borne by the taxpayers. It's it's the company's responsibility. They eat it if they if they go over the uh, original intended cost. A late completion is on their dime as well. They have a big incentive to complete on time because there's no toll revenue flows until the road is open and can actually have paying customers. Um, and uh, maintenance risks, again, they, they're constrained not only by their own interest in serving customers, but by the conditions in the agreement for that. So, and a very important point is life cycle costs. Traditionally in the United States, uh, uh, as a, based on a reform from the progressive era, uh, highway agencies, like other government agencies, do what's called design, bid, build, where the, the state DOT will typically either design it in-house or, or hire a designer to design the highway, the bridge or highway project, then go out to bid for a construction contractor. Well, what turns out to happen a lot of times is that the uh, uh, construction contractor finds all sorts of problems, real and imagined, with the design, and so change order, change order, change order. You bid low, but you make it up on change orders. But also, the bigger, the bigger problem is the life cycle cost because the design is based, usually the competitive competition for the design is based on whoever does, you know, says they can build exactly what the state DOT has specified at the lowest construction cost wins the job. That was understandable reform in the days when there was lots and lots of corruption and payoffs in government contracting. But what happens is you get the cheapest design, not the most durable design, and you end up often having much higher ongoing maintenance costs than if maybe you spent 10% more up front to build a more durable pavement and, uh, and, and designs that, that have minimal maintenance. So a company that's going to be the de facto owner for 50 years, let's say, and responsible for all that maintenance is going to do a different kind of design. They're going to do a design that minimizes their life cycle costs that they're going to have to bear. And this is a good thing for the economy because it means that we're not wasting resources on cheap design that deteriorates, especially if there's political incentives not to maintain it as well as it should be. Uh, so you're wasting a lot of resources through a bad process. And so this, this is a set of benefits that are laid out in, in the chapter of the book that a lot of people still don't really understand. Here's just, a, 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 there's two slides. This is the largest projects that have been privately financed and are, that are operating now under uh, these kind of long-term agreements in the United States. This is the first slide. And these are, I think, they're in, in dollar size. 5.72 billion is, is the highest one. And the second slide, uh, down to the smallest one in, in Charlotte, North Carolina, that's still under construction, supposed to open at the end of the year. $36 billion has been invested so far over, over about 15 years. Now, over 15 years, that's not all that much in terms of the total U.S. highway system. But these are almost all projects built on limited access highways like freeways and interstates. So it's a subset of all highways. And really, mostly what I'm talking about here is for major highways. We're not talking about local streets and roads or two-lane country. We're talking about the big ticket items that where we have a lot of our big problems in the highway system. So it's, it's a positive message that we've made a start, but it's nowhere near as common in use as in a lot of these other countries. Another thing that really impresses me is some of the creativity that's gone in when, you know, when companies are at, given a problem to solve and not told exactly how to do it. Uh, they've come up with some really innovative things. For example, this is a toll agency, the Tampa Hillsborough Expressway Authority that needed to widen their commuter expressway that goes from a suburb uh, east of Tampa into downtown. But there's going to be a big hassle to acquire enough right-of-way alongside to widen it. 
uh, and they figured they needed about three more lanes each way. So they came up with this creative idea of elevated, reversible, kind of like right you have out here, express lanes uh, built in the median on six feet wide pillars. So they call it because it's the they only need the lanes inbound in the morning, three lanes in and in the afternoon. So they call it the equivalent of six lanes on six feet of right of way. And this kind of thing could be done all over the country uh, in, in most, most metro areas. When they say you can't build, well, this is in Melbourne. It was the first investor-owned project in Melbourne, Australia. I drove um, this in, a, in an Avis rental car in 2000. And off to the left, it's a combination of tunnel and elevated to, in a, in, to make freeways that stopped at the outskirts of downtown be able to go under through and under downtown and provide some better access to the downtown but also people who didn't who just wanted to get from one side to the other instead of going all the way around they could go through and this elevated section off to the left of the photo uh, there's a high-rise residential building and so the company transurban on its own hook built that sound tube there to make it an artistic feature, but also to shield that building from, from the roadway noise that would be created by this new thing coming in there. Uh, this is my favorite story. This is a map that the orange line is the A86 ring road around Paris. The dotted line, the vertical line there is the missing link that was missing for about 40 years. Now, why was it missing? Because it would go through Versailles, where the, where the palace is, the historic area, and there was endless battles. The state really wanted, they need, we, you know, we need the connectivity, people dumped off, blah, 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 blah. But no way that was gonna happen. So one of the French private tower companies, Coffee <coughs> Group, went to the French government with an unsolicited proposal and said, if you give us some leeway on this, we will do this whole thing as a five and a half mile long toll tunnel. We use tunnel boring machine, do it deep underground so it doesn't shake the foundations of the historic buildings. Uh, and uh, we'll pay for it ourselves, we'll maintain it, just like the other toll concessions in, in France. It took a few years, serious few years, for the government to get their arms around it because they decided this is going to have to be cars only. The main north-south route would be cars only. They would do a shorter truck tunnel over on the left-hand side, that, that angled line. And here was the key to, to making the, the cars tunnel uh, affordable. Those, uh, that's a cross-section, double-deck, uh, northbound one level, southbound the other level. But the dimension, the vertical clearance is the same clearance as in parking structures. So now, if you remember your geometry, the area of a circle is proportional to the radius squared. So they cut in half the size, the amount of excavation would have to do by, by getting the government to agree to cars only for that tunnel. Uh, otherwise, it would have caught, they could not have afforded it out of what they thought they could charge if they had to make standard size lanes in that. And there's me, uh, uh, along with a guy from Coffee Group, wearing our hard hats a few months before it opened when they were finished with construction but still doing the shakedowns, testing of all the safety systems and so forth. They actually had to special build uh, paramedic vehicles and fire vehicles to uh, operate in those low height things because the standard vehicles were too high. So it was a huge project, but it's worked and it's been a, a success for them and for, for, needless to say, for the motorists in Paris. Now, where does the money come from? Uh, as I said, debt, debt and equity. Turns out we have something that's been going on now for more than a decade called Global Infrastructure Investment Funds. These are funds that raise equity, you know, the down payment kind of money, to put into all kinds of infrastructure, electric uh, distribution systems, new alternative energy, uh, toll roads, airports, seaports, whatever, infrastructure. Uh, but they have to, what they want to do is invest equity, because you can make higher returns on equity than you can from debt. Uh, but you can't invest equity in Atlanta Airport because it's owned by the government. You can't buy shares in the Atlanta Hartsfield Airport. Same way with, with uh, any uh, government-owned toll roads. There's no equity in them uh, because they're owned by the public. So what they're looking for is these P3 mega projects in transportation and, and other kinds of infrastructure. The second category is pension, public pension funds. And this most people aren't aware of this, but public pension funds are starting to have, you know, you've read about probably that a, the majority of public sector pension funds have very large unfunded liabilities. And this is a problem over the next 25 or 30 years. It's going to really be serious. And so they're trying to diversify their portfolios and have maybe 5% of their total uh, be invested in infrastructure. And so they've traditionally invested in railroads because those are privately owned. 
and in uh, electric utilities, but they would really have a, like to have a more broad portfolio. So they started about five years ago investing in privatized Heathrow Airport, privatized Gatwick Airport, uh, some toll roads, uh, things in, in Latin America. But what they really would like to do is invest a lot more in the United States, in U.S. infrastructure, uh, but there's not enough problems, no projects. You know, we all we go to transportation conferences, and the, the wailing and gnashing of teeth is always, we have all these needs, and there's not enough money. Well, you go to invest infrastructure, investment conference, there's all this money, where are the projects? So, I mean, there's, there's a, you know, two things there that need to come together, it seems to me, to, solve, to help solve a big, big problem that we have. Uh, the global infrastructure funds, the top 50 funds have raised 360, 316 billion in the last, just the last five years, and all but the estimate is about 450 billion for all of the 50 plus all the smaller ones. And uh, typically the, the project would have 25% equity, 75% debt, so you're looking at the equity alone could be uh, the source of almost $2 trillion worth of projects, and that's global, and it's all kinds of infrastructure. So how much could we get for highways? Well. That depends. Do we have projects or not? And so part of my purpose of the book is to try to encourage people that this model makes sense. We need more of these projects. We should do more projects because of all the benefits that it will produce. And the money is sitting there waiting to invest here rather than in Brazil or Argentina. And so I kind of close the book with saying, all right, how, how can we start making the transition? And it seems to me you kind of start where the need is great and where it lends itself to, uh, to this kind of thing. And uh, the suggestion is start with rebuilding the interstates. The interstate highways started in 1956 with, depending on the project, a design lifetime of 30 to 50 years. Well, this is now 60 years since the program was authorized. An awful lot of them are, are you know, some have been rebuilt, uh, but the large majority have not, and are aging, and, and they're also it's a lot of big interchanges that are obsolete and were designed for half the traffic that they have now. That's why we have uh, the, the what, 100 truck bottlenecks around the country that are denoted by the, by the trucking industry, and rightly so, that are terrible. They're almost all urban interstate intersections, it, or interchanges. Um, we did a study at Reason about uh, five years ago that I, I uh, was led the lead on, estimated the net present value of rebuilding all of the interstates over the next 25 years, uh, and widening them where it looked justified would be a trillion dollars. I can guarantee you there is no program anywhere on the horizon at the federal government or in any state uh, ready to pay for that. So this seems like a need and the funds waiting to be married up to do this through the mechanism of expanding toll agencies and uh, uh, using more of these long-term P3 public-private partnership uh, agreements. And dedicated truck lanes, uh, part of our study used detailed freight data from Federal Highway Administration to analyze their projections of how what fraction of total vehicle miles of travel on every individual long-distance interstate system uh, segment in the country, state by state, what what fraction of them would be 40% or more of all the traffic by 2040? And it turns out we identified about 13 multi-state corridors where there's a very clear case for dedicated truck lanes as part of a redesign of the interstate system. Uh, then we say that the next step should be uh, the urban part of the interstates, uh, freeways modernized with First of all, the networks of express tollings like is already starting to happen. Networks like, like is in the plan here are in the long-range transportation plans of about a dozen large metro areas, most of the ones that are in the top 20 of the most congested, and that's a very good thing. But eventually you're going to have to rebuild a lot of, of the rest of it, and at, the t at that point in time, I think you really start, need to start looking at some kind of modest peak period pricing. Not the, not the high variable prices on the express lanes, that's for very high time value trips, but a, uh, a peak toll that's affordable to most people all the time on the regular lanes would help to finance the uh, reconstruction of the, of the urban parts of the interstates. The Trump infrastructure proposal, to the extent there still is one, uh, and that's an open question, had actually a lot of, you know, small policy changes that would really help. It had incentives for states to use more of these kinds of agreements and make more projects possible. 
It would remove the, ban, the federal ban on interstate tolling and also the federal ban on commercial rest areas, which I think would make the reconstructed interstates much, much better. Uh, it would expand the tax exempt financing for, for these P3s, uh, which is available in a very limited amount today. And of course, the environmental streamlining would help any uh, uh, highway projects to be done better and faster. Now, the last thing, I, I close the book and close these remarks with a couple of thoughts on why this might actually happen. I mean, I'm not going to say this will happen. I'm um, realist. Because it's, it's a big lift. It's a big, big change. But uh, we have three major problems that uh, uh, I don't see have a, any kind of solution in sight. One is the federal government is gradually going insolvent. You read the Congressional Budget Office projections, the annual deficit for the next decade, a trillion dollars or more every single year. And after that, if they were to do the projections longer, it's worse because of the ballooning of entitlement payments as the baby boom generation continues to retire and live and live longer. I mean, that, that's a good thing in a way, but it's a very bad thing for the federal government's uh, liabilities. Second is the problems of state, you know, so that suggests that the federal government may have to cut back. It, more likely than not, it cannot do the kind of continuing to bail out the highway trust fund every year with, with 10 or 20 billion dollars of, of general fund money. That leaves more burden potentially on the state governments, but you know, with states, most of them having big unfunded pension liabilities that are going to continue getting bad as the baby boom retires, they're not in a position properly, most states, to ramp up their own highway programs. And then the fading of per gallon fuel tax. I didn't discuss. I discussed that in the book at some length. Um, we've had fuel, federal fuel economy standards for about 30 years now, and uh, cars today go twice as far on a gallon of gas as they did 20 years ago. The, the tax is collected per gallon, not per mile. So that means a car today that goes 10,000 miles a year is only generating the, the revenue. For, that does fix half as many miles uh, because it's, it's per gallon, not per mile. Uh, so there's a growing consensus in the transportation community, not among the general public, because the public doesn't really realize this. We are going to need to replace per gallon taxes with some kind of per mile charges. Uh, and there's pilot programs been going on around the country for about a decade, and more are still going on. I was in one just recently on, from the I-95 Corridor Coalition. I had a little gadget that plugged into the diagnostic port of my car and measured how many miles I drove and said what the per mile, two cents a mile, hypothetical price, and compared that to what I was paying in fuel taxes because of where I live in Florida, blah, blah, blah. So these projects, we're learning things from that about how to do it. But anyway, those are three problems that mean the status quo that we've known, that we've lived with for the past hundred years in highways is, is not going to continue. So it's going to be replaced with something different, and the question is what? Uh, Second is three positive factors that will help move toward the solution that I'm recommending. One is that there's growing awareness. More and more people now understand what's been going on worldwide and are starting to see these projects in Dallas and Houston and, and uh, San Diego and even in San Francisco Bay Area, Washington DC, here in Atlanta, that these express toll lanes and some of them being done as long-term P3, they really work and they're better and they don't they largely don't use the scarce gas tax monies. They mostly use private money and, and the toll revenues. And we have the growth of these, equ these equity investment funds that are dying to invest more in the United States as opposed to overseas. And that's a good thing that helps solve where is the money going to come from. And then the desire and need of U.S. pension funds to invest not just in overseas P3 projects, but right here at home where they're more comfortable. And that, I think, could be a political benefit because these are mostly pension funds that represent uh, public employees, most of whom belong to unions. And so who looks out for the interests of public workers uh, more than others is Democrats. And so we need, this needs to become a bipartisan issue for it to really gain traction and be accepted. Republicans tend to, on average, I'm just being a little stereotyping here, tend to be more favorable toward things like private sector investment uh, but Democrats really want to be sure the pension fund, the pensions of all these uh, public servants don't crater and that money is actually there. And if the pension funds start coming out saying very publicly, we need to have more of these projects, your laws need to change so that we can have these projects because we want to invest in them, that could, that could make a difference in making this a more bipartisan issue. And anyway, anyway I hope that happens. So 
to sum up, uh, what I've tried to explain is that the model we've had for highways for 100 years is really, it's failing manifestly. It has not solved the problems that are endemic. And it needs to change because there's underlying factors that mean the status quo can't really continue in the way it has. Uh, we, and I think the best solution to this problem is to adapt the utility model that's worked well. We have some of the best public utilities in the world, and a lot of them that were all state-owned in, in, in Europe and elsewhere have been privatized in the last two decades, inspired by the success of investor-owned utilities in the United States. So that's, that's very important. And I think that means there's a good case, and, and our toll roads are largely successful. And that is another, another way to do, accomplish mostly the same thing. And we can build on both of those models. And the ingredients, we have the basic ingredients we need. We've solved the Milton Friedman problem of, of we can now charge per mile using all electronic tolling, certainly on all these limited access facilities at least, which is all the major highways. We have the long-term P3, the utility franchise model, uh, and it's working in the United States as it's working elsewhere. We have companies, U.S. and global companies, with impressive track records of delivering projects on time, on budget, that customers like to use. And we have uh, willing investors in the infrastructure funds and so forth. What is really needed is to put those pieces together and, and solve the problem. And that's really why I wrote the book and why I'm glad you listened to me today. <laughs> so thank you very much. And uh, I think we have time. just open express toll lanes, as, as you described them. Um, to me, one of the potential benefits was um, for transit operating in those lanes. And one of the challenges for any type of transit, which I'd like for you to address, is riders of choice, right. the degree to which transit a transit truck takes longer than driving, if that difference is significant, they're yeah. unlikely to do that. So my question is, how much benefit for potential riders of choice will the managed lanes give us, and to what degree is an investment in a form of transit, that bus rapid transit yeah. that's yeah. shared lanes, using those same lanes, to what degree to, could that help to reduce traffic congestion? Thank you so much. I, I did not plant that question, but I'm very <laughs> glad he asked it. Because express toll lanes, managed lanes, are a two-for-one solution. They are a solution for individual motorists. They are also a tremendously cost-effective solution for transit. What we've, uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, in I, I was an advisor to Florida DOT on their first managed lanes project on I-95 in Miami absolute parking lot during rush hours, morning and afternoon. Uh, the first seven miles in the most congested part of that whole corridor opened about eight, eight or nine years ago now, and I was very, very glad to see it. And in the first five years after it opened, the express bus ridership between the Fort Lauderdale area and downtown Miami quadrupled. And uh, the, all the bus, all the transit agencies had to do was buy more buses. They also had to, had to start building more park and ride lots in Broward County, where I live, because of demand being so high. Now, I have never seen a quadrupling of, of transit ridership in that short a period of time. And that, I think, is an illustration. Faster and reliable uh, schedules on, on transit is what's really made that difference. It has taken people who used to uh, uh, drive in that horrible congestion uh, because uh, you know, the bus was even slower. Because the bus, bus was in the so-called HOV lane, but there were so many violations that it was just as slow as the regular lanes most of the time. So the bus get, buses now go typically 45 or 50 miles an hour during almost all of the peak periods. And they have reliable schedules. So for a person who can't afford the variable toll each day, which the average person can't afford that on every on five day a week, twice a day. Uh, it's there for the high value trips that everybody has from time to time, and only only a few lawyers have every day. Sorry, apologize to any lawyers in the room. <laughs> every day that they can afford to do. Uh, so the bus system benefits hugely from this, and 
one of the big things, if you compare it with any kind of a rail transit project, uh, putting, putting express buses on managed lanes that are generally uncongested means that the transit system doesn't have to come up with the capital expenditures for the, for the guideway and the right-of-way. All those people paying with their electronic tolling are the ones who are paying for it. And that's a huge difference. The transit, as I said, transit only has to buy buses and maybe spend a little on park and ride lots. So this is a huge win for transit. It's the most cost-effective investment in transit that any metro area can make. And all the projects that Reason has done around the country, starting with the one here in Atlanta in 2006, where we recommend a network of express tollings, we also recommend, as the concomitant of that, a big expansion of express, a region-wide express bus service that because most of the commutes in a large metro area are from anywhere to anywhere, and uh, you need to have that kind of a, of a high-speed network for the transit system to have any chance of being competitive. Sorry, that was a very long answer, but it's a very important question. Uh, that, yes. How do you see autonomous vehicles and microtransit affecting okay. the future because predicted vehicle counts are going to be down? Autonomous vehicle impact. There's, a, there's a, about a third of a chapter near the end of the book uh, on that. It's a little bit out of date already because this is a fast-changing area. But my colleague, uh, Baruch Feigenbaum, sitting right there, goes every year to the annual, the biggest annual autonomous vehicle conference sponsored by the Transportation Research Board. And uh, uh, so I have a pipeline right in. I've never been to it, but I have a pipeline from Baruch to the data. What we are learning now, the general consensus among uh, serious transportation researchers who are up to speed on autonomous vehicles is that the net effect over the next 30 years is going to be more vehicle miles of travel than are in the standard projections. Now that may seem surprising because there's two different things going on, or three things going on, that, that the net effect of which is more. One, the, the, effect, the positive in terms of, of uh, more vehicles per lane per mile safely is the you know, cooperative adaptive cruise control and this kind of thing means cars can be spaced closer together so the density that can go at a reasonable speed safely means we may not have to add as many lanes to our urban freeways as would be projected in today's long-range plans for that reason. The offsetting factors are twofold. One is mobility as a service. To the extent that there's a large penetration of robo-taxis that cruise around all day and that reduce the need for parking structures, which is in everybody's dreams. Oh boy, we can convert parking structures to something else. Uh, those cars are out there uh, on all the different streets and roads, including on the freeways. And that's adding to VMT a lot more than, than is projected in standard plans when cars are mostly parked. Most, when most cars are parked the vast majority of the time. The third factor is three categories of people who cannot drive today. Kids, very old people, and handicapped people uh, will all have personal mobility, personal automobility, and KPMG has done a projection that that factor, not taking into account the other uh, other factors, that factor would increase 2040, I think it was, uh, vehicle miles of travel from today's uh, three trillion annual total nation to five trillion, just from that factor. Now then you offset against that the uh, the density effect on urban freeways. But then you still have to add back to that the, uh, the, the, the robo taxis cruising around all the time. So it's going to be more VMT. The, the MPO in Broward County, where I live, is already uh, making, starting to make their plans, saying that we're going to need, in the next 20 years, we're going to need more lane mile capacity on all of our system as the gradual introduction of autonomy. But also, you know, there's one you have to be careful comparing the future, the hypothetical future when. AVs are so good and so affordable that all vehicles are autonomous. That may happen. Nobody's clear on, on how soon. That may be 2040 or 2050, if it happens at all. Um, so between now and whenever that period is, we're going to have mixed fleet. And that means uh, that all kinds of, of problems, you, uh, things you can assume would be true, maybe you wouldn't need traffic signals at intersections. Well, with a mixed fleet, you're going to still need traffic signals. So, I mean, it's, this is a complex environment that we're moving into. And I'm sorry, again, that's another long answer, but it's a tough, it's a complicated subject, and that's a, that's a, a little top of the waves answer. Thanks. Chris. Um, your thoughts on commercial or truck tolling. Uh, in a lot of the European examples, that's a significant part of the toll revenue stream, commercial traffic. Right. But uh, right now, I believe that is a 
even a greater leap than getting uh, Americans in general to accept tolls on um, personal vehicles. But right. your, your thoughts there? Well, it's true that, that the trucking industry, and, and I have friends who are right here in the trucking industry, and Ken Armstrong, the head of the Florida Trucking Association, just bought my book and likes it a lot. Uh, but I've been trying to have a dialogue for the last decade at least with, with senior uh, ATA trucking officials. The official position is still no more tolls, no where, no how. They have an alliance for toll-free interstates. Uh, and I think, you know, I can understand the trucking industry has been burned and taken advantage of. Um, what a lot of states would love to see to turn trucks into the cash cow to pay for the rest of their system. Uh, and that's, that's really unfair. Uh, there was a, a proposal in the early, mid-1980s in Virginia to add truck toll lanes to I-81. It was a huge, huge political battle. The truck industry went to war over it. And the, the inanity of that, from my standpoint, was that you know, they were going to build additional lanes that would be for trucks only, but they were only going to charge the trucks for them. When motorists would benefit hugely from having the trucks over there and, and not having to you know, contend with them in, in their lanes too. Uh, so this is a benefit that everybody should be paying for. Uh, uh, and, uh, and so my hope is that we can come up with a, an, I, Reason Foundation produced a study two years ago called Truck, Truck Friendly Tolling for Next Century Interstates that uh, was based in part on one-on-one -on -one research that I conducted with senior officials of ATA, off the record, they were not quoted, <laughs> But talking about what is the trucking industry really concerned about with tolling and what would be needed to have it be a user-friendly system. And there were a lot of things that were incorporated into that as a recommendation, too, too much into the weeds for talking about here. But that report is on our website and, and uh, I, think, I think there's room for having a serious conversation over the next I don't know, three to five years uh, with, with thought leaders in the trucking industry to think about, you know, how are we actually going to pay for a trillion dollar revamp of the interstates? Um, if we all agree it's needed, and if it does not seem likely that uh, uh, the Congress is going to come up with the money or program to do it, what are we going to do? The states actually own the interstates. So most, a lot of people don't realize that, but they're state-owned facilities. Feds paid 90% of the upfront construction costs. They're paying some money that's usable for maintenance, but there's no reconstruction program. And there was not going to be, as far as I can tell. Uh, and if the trucking industry position and, and uh, has been for the last decade, we need, a, we need a big increase in diesel tax or something equivalent to that that would be used for reconstructing the interstates. Well, I think that's, that's a nice dream. But as I said, there are 120 programs that get money from the Federal Highway Trust Fund for out of the user taxes. Every one of those programs has a constituency. If there's a significant increase in either the gas tax, federal gas tax, or the federal diesel tax, you can believe that every single one of those is going to want, well, we want our share of that. So you're not going to have anything like all of that money being for rebuilding the interstates or rebuilding or building truck lanes or anything like that. It's going to be pitter, you know, piddled away on every single one of those 120 programs. It's my best guess, actually. So, um, yeah. long story, but and, and many chapters to be written. Yes, right here. Do you have knowledge of and an opinion on the Atlanta area outer beltway that's been floating out there and for uh, years and yeah, little yeah. bits of land um, owned and such. Many, well, when, when we were doing the Atlanta, the recent Atlanta study in 2006, I think it was, I looked into that a little bit and, and uh, I was advised, everybody that I talked to in they said, you really don't want to go there, that's, that's a lightning rod and, and uh, <laughs> so we made the pragmatic decision not to include that in the, in, in the recommendations. My personal view at that time, seeing what, uh, what Houston and Dallas and Phoenix and Denver have done is that an outer beltway would probably make a lot of sense. Uh, it would be politically very challenging. There'd be a lot of environmental things that would have to be considered. Uh, but Orlando, and Orlando is just finishing the last part of theirs. And it goes through a, a, uh, a wetland and a lot of it's having to be built on and all kinds of mitigations had to be built, but they're doing it because Atlanta sees the ability to continue growing and have affordable suburban housing as a critical part of the growth of that metro area. And uh, uh, so 
and again, I have not studied this, uh, not looked at it since 2006, so uh, that's just a top of the head uh, impression. But uh, other, other metro areas that are growing and healthy and have affordable housing are do it do, do out of do, always. Do you think something like that could be done using the public-private partnership model? Um, I think it probably could, although I mean, my guess is that the toll revenues would probably not be sufficient, so it would have to be partly uh, state-funded. It's my guess. You know, you know, obviously, the devil's always in the details. You, know, you have to look at the figures. But uh, I, I doubt if toll revenues alone would, would be enough to support it, at least in the early years. Let's get uh, one more. One more. Okay. You had your hand up. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> In both uh, transit and in toll lanes, we sometimes think of a person sharing a ride as an external benefit. In economics, it's an uh, externality. Right, right. Is that to be used in figuring transit fares and or tolls on uh -huh. roads? <laughs> Good question. I mean, that's the principle on, by which we have uh, HOV lanes, carpool lanes, that you reward people who share rides, and it's the reason why a lot of ex a lot of managed lanes still give a free passage to people who meet a certain occupancy requirement. In principle, my view is is that everybody should pay, uh, 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 and that if you split the toll, you're still getting a benefit. You know, with you split it with two people, you split it with three people, whatever. Uh, but politically, I mean, uh, that's hard to do. I will point out, though, that the the a pricing system uh, only work only does its job of, of controlling congestion if at least the vast majority of the vehicles in the lane are subject to the price. Because and what we see in, in California, where there's vast numbers of so-called clean green vehicles that get stickers that go ride in free, not only in HOV lanes but also in in toll lanes. Um, at certain times of the day when the express lanes are needed most, the peak of the peak, they close them to toll paying customers because they're full of qualified carpools and qualified green vehicles. So this completely de destroys the value of the pricing precisely when it has the most benefit. So when push comes to shove, I think you know, this is a policy from the 20th century uh, before we knew that pricing would do such wonderful things. I think we don't want to risk destroying the value of the pricing. Uh, in the name of, of this externality, which is still there in a modified form because people can share the toll. Sure. Thank you very much. And have a